Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Here on this channel we talk about actual history. And today I'm going to bring you some actual history from this book right here. It's one that I recently acquired, The Evolution of a State or Recollections of Old Texas Days by Noah Smithwick. So today this story we're going to read about takes place near present day Schulenburg, Texas. Uh, and so this is happening while Smithwick in 1836 was serving under Captain Tumlinson in his Rangers company. The Indians, taking advantage of the disturbed conditions of the country in 1836, were committing depredations and the army numbering not more than five or six hundred men rank and file was preparing to invade Mexico and bring her rulers to a realizing sense of their situation. Having no time, therefore, for such trivial matters as the murdering of the citizens by the Indians, so the government provided for their protection as best as it could with the means at its disposal, graciously permitting the citizens to protect themselves by organizing and equipping ranging companies. Captain Tumlinson was commissioned to raise a company on the Colorado River, and early in January 1836 he reported for duty with a company of 60 mounted men, myself included. We were assigned to duty on the head of the waters of Brushy Creek, some 30 miles northwest of the site of the present capital of Texas, that city not having yet even been projected. The appointed rendezvous was Hornsby Station, 10 miles below Austin on the Colorado, from which place we were to proceed at once to our post, taking with us such materials as were necessary to aid us in the construction of a blockhouse. We were on hand at the appointed time, and just as we were preparing for our supper, a young white woman, an entire stranger, her clothes hanging in shreds about her torn and bleeding body, dragged herself into camp and sank exhausted on the ground. The feeling of rest and relief on finding herself among friends able and willing to help her so overcame her overtaxed strength that it was some little time before she could give a coherent explanation of her situation. While she at length recovered, she told us that her name was Hibbins, that in company with her husband, brother, and two small children, she was journeying overland up to their home on the Guadalupe when they were attacked by a band of Comanches. The two men were killed, the wagon was plundered, and herself and children were made prisoners, she being bound onto one of her mules and her little three-year-old boy on the other. The other child was a young babe, and the poor little creature, whose sufferings the mother could not allay, cried so continuously that at length one of the Indians snatched it from her and dashed its brains out against a tree. The scene of the attack being a lonely spot on a lonely road, the cunning Indians knew there was little risk of the outrage being discovered till they were beyond the reach of pursuit. So when a cold norther met them at the crossing of the Colorado, about where the city of Austin now stands, they sought the shelter of a cedar break and lay by to wait for it to subside, confident that Mrs. Hibbins could not escape with her child, and trusting to her mother's love to prevent her leaving it. The Indians allowed her to lie unbound bound, not even putting out guards. It was bitterly cold, and wrapping themselves in their buffalo robes, they were soon sound asleep. But there was no sleep for Mrs. Hibbins. She knew, as did her captors, that there was small hope of rescue from the discovery of her murdered relatives, and, realizing that the only hope lay in herself, she resolved to escape and to rescue her child. There was no time to lose, as another day's travel would take her so far beyond the reach of the settlements that it would be impossible for her to procure help before the Indians reached their stronghold. So she waited until assured by their breathing that her captors were asleep, then, summoning all her courage, she carefully tucked the robe about her sleeping child and stole away, leaving him to the mercy of the brutal barbarians. She felt sure the river they had crossed was the Colorado, and knew there were settlements below. How far down she had no idea, but that seeming to offer the only means of escape, she made straight for the river, hiding her tracks in its icy waters, hurried away as fast as the darkness would permit. Once she thought she heard her child call, and her heart stood still with fear that the Indians would be awakened and miss her. She momentarily expected to hear a yell of alarm, and not daring to leave the shelter of the bottom timber, she meandered the winding stream, sometimes wading in the shallow water along the edge, and again working her way through the brush and briars, tearing her clothing and lacerating her flesh, 
never pausing in her painful journey till late in the afternoon when she came upon the first sign of civilization and some gentle cows feeding in the river bottom. Perceiving that they were milk cows, she felt that she must be near a settlement, but she dared not attempt to call assistance lest the Indians be in pursuit. So she secreted herself near the cows, which she surmised would soon be going home, and waiting till they had finished their evening meal, followed them to the station, having spent nearly 24 hours in traveling a distance of only 10 miles on open ground. Fortunate beyond hope in finding the rangers there, she implored us to save her child, describing the mule he rode, the band of Indians, and the direction they were traveling. Hastily dispatching our supper, we were soon in the saddle, and with a trusty guide, Reuben Hornsby, traveled on till we judged that we must be near the trail, and fearful of crossing it in the darkness, we halted and waited for daylight. As soon as it was light enough, our scouts were out and soon found the trail fresh and well-defined, as if the marauders were exercising neither haste nor caution in their retreat. Having no doubt spent a good portion of the day in a fruitless search for their escaped prisoner, they did not seem to be at all alarmed as to the consequences of her escape, and it was about ten o'clock in the morning when we came upon them, just preparing to break camp. Taken completely by surprise, they broke for the shelter of a cedar break, leaving everything except such weapons as they hastily snatched as they started. I was riding a fleet horse, which, becoming excited, carried me right in among the fleeing Indians, one of whom jumped behind a tree and fired on me with a musket, fortunately missing his aim. Unable to control my horse, I jumped off of him and gave chase to my assailant on foot, knowing his gun was empty. I fired on him and had the satisfaction of seeing him fall. My blood was up, and leaving him for dead, I ran on, loading my rifle as I ran, hoping to bring down another. A limb knocked my hat off, and one of my comrades, catching a glimpse of me flying bareheaded through the break on foot, mistook me for a Comanche and raised his gun to check my flight. But another ranger dashed the gun aside in time to save me. The brave whom I shot lay flat on the ground and loaded his gun, which he discharged at Captain Tumlinson, narrowly missing him and killing his horse. When Conrad Rohrer ran up, snatching the gun from the Indian's hands, dealt him a blow on the head with it, crushing his skull. The other Indians made good their escape into the cedar break, where it was worse than useless to follow them. But we got all their horses and other plunder, and to crown our success, we achieved the main object of the expedition, which was the rescue of the little boy. Though the heedlessness of one of our men came near robbing us of our prize in a shocking manner, the Indians, careful of the preservation of their little captive, they intended to make a good Comanche of him, had wrapped him up warmly in a buffalo robe and tied him on his mule, preparatory to resuming their journey. When we rushed upon them, they had no time to remove him, and the mule, being startled by our charge, started to run. When one of our men, Rohrer, not seeing that the rider was a child, gave chase, and putting his gun against the back of the boy, pulled the trigger. Fortunately, the gun misfired. He tried again with like results. The third time his finger was on the trigger when one of the other boys, perceiving with horror the tragedy that was about to be enacted, knocked the gun up and with it firing clear, sending a ball whistling over the head of the rescued child. Providence seemed to have interposed to save him that day. The boys held an inquest on the dead Indian and deciding that the gunshot wound would have proved fatal, awarded me the scalp. I modestly waived my claim in favor of Rohrer, but he, generous soul, declared that according to all rules of the chase, the man who brought down the game was entitled to the pelt, and he himself scalped the Indian, tying the loathsome trophy to my saddle, where I permitted it to remain, thinking that it might afford the poor woman Hibbins, whose family its owner had helped to murder, some satisfaction to see that gory evidence that one of the wretches had paid the penalty of his crime. The scene of the rescue was on Walnut Creek, about 10 miles northwest of Austin. Gathering up our booty, which was inconsiderable, we started on our return, and late in the afternoon rode into the station in triumph. There was a suspicious moisture in many an eye, long since a stranger to tears, when the overjoyed mother clasped her only remaining treasure to her heart, and I could not help stealing a glance at Rohrer, and tried to imagine what his feelings would have been had not his gun refused to obey his murderous behests. 
Poor Rohrer. He was as brave a soul as ever drew the breath of life, but his excitable temperament rendered him as dangerous to friend as foe. In fact, I got to be more afraid of him than of the enemy when we went into an engagement. He was finally ambushed and killed by an Indian in Thomas Moore's yard. We went on up to our appointed station where we built the old Tumlinson blockhouse, making it our headquarters till the invasion of Santa Ana necessitated our recall after which it was burned by the Indians and never rebuilt. And, save this old dismantled hulk, there is not to my knowledge one of those old Tumlinson rangers now living. So that was the end of this story. Again, this was from this book, Evolution of a State or Recollections of Old Texas Days by Noah Smithwick. Uh, so he was a ranger back in 1836 when he helped save the Hibbins woman and her child uh, from a band of Comanches that had attacked and killed her family. So if you want to hear more stories like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.